Hi, I'm Paul Midgen, co-chair of DMARC.org, and this session is the mailbox and receiver breakout from the uh, MOG 26 in Baltimore training session for DMARC, co-presented by myself and Mike Adkins. Um, the attendees to this session were folks who attended both the general training session, uh, general interest capacity in rolling out DMARC, as well as they also fulfill the role of being either small, medium, large mail receivers, or they're on that side of the business. They either provide a receiving infrastructure or mailboxes or something like that. They are not senders and ESPs. That, the talk for, that fo for those folks is covered in a different session, uh, which Mike is presenting. So you know you're watching the right video if you're in the business of receiving mail or providing services to folks who do receive mail. Um, so the first question that we typically cover or field from this audience is, how do I know I'm ready for DMARC? Um, the main thing to think about if you're in the business of receiving mail is, is knowing who you typically receive mail from. If you receive mail uh, on behalf of your users sent to you from domains that tend to have a brand protection or phishing problem, such as, uh, say, anybody in the financial services sector, people who send mail on behalf of brokerage accounts, um, large banks, institutions, uh, auction houses, generally anything that you would consider sensitive mail that would be attractive to an attacker to spoof, either for the purpose of obtaining credentials of some kind, such as login information or credit card information or anything else, you're probably a candidate for running DMARC. Um, if you're on the low volume side, this is really less of a decision to make because the impact to you will be so minimal you really kind of have to ask yourself if you lose anything by doing this. So from our point of view, in the messaging ecosystem, you're better off deploying DMARC support on your inbound messaging servers than not. Um, another way to think about it is if you're already going to the trouble to validate SPF and DKIM on your inbound mail, DMARC doesn't add any complexity to that. It's just a policy layer on top of it. So you're not actually doing something like increasing, say, the cryptographic processing overhead that goes on your servers. You're not having to think about, do I need to buy more infrastructure? Really, it just comes down to a policy de decision about the kinds of services you want to provide or the kinds of protections you want to provide to the people that you serve. Um, in terms of getting started or an evaluation, you want to look at your current inbound SPF and DKIM validation practices. DMARC does not work with sender ID, so if you're one of the receivers who validates sender ID, you need to consider deploying support for SPF. A number of folks, mailbox level provider members of uh, MOG, and those participants who are also happen to be members of DMARC have in the past provided data that shows that the results of sender ID and SPF evaluation are typically identical. So if you have any qualms either in management or your operation staff about doing one versus the other, just know that for the most part, an SPF 1.0 record will be treated by everyone as an SPF 1.0 record, whether you validate SPF or sender ID. So then the second part is validating your DKIM practices. Uh, make sure that you attempt validation of all DKIM signed mail and pay particular attention to messages that have what's known as an author domain signature. So any message where the D equals field in the signature block is equal to the 5322 from domain. This is what DMARC operates on, so if you, for concerns of performance of your inbound servers, want to choose just one signature and a message to evaluate, choose that one. DMARC doesn't say you can't evaluate all signatures that are present, but that's the one we really want you to work with. Um, the second thing people consider is, as well, do I have to do one or the other? Because you only need an aligning result from a single authentication mechanism to obtain a DMARC pass. Um, we encourage you to do both because there are well-known scenarios where both SPF and DKIM can fail. Not necessarily at the same time, but independently. Um, the typical case for uh, SPF failure is if you have a relay or a forwarding account in the middle of the, the chain between the sender and the receiver, such as somebody who, who went to college, has an old alumni account, they relay their mail through that, that's going to break SPF. Um, the typical case where DKIM breaks is anybody who modifies content. So, if a signed message is relayed through a mailing list server or another service that inserts, say, a can spam compliant footer at the bottom or an unsubscribe link, if that content wasn't there when the message was signed, it's going to break. Um, the cases where one or the other breaks are fairly frequent, but the case of both of them failing for the same message 
is far less infrequent. So you're actually reducing false positive DMARC policy application by validating both. Um, so then the only other consideration here, since we are talking about the auth practices that you run on your domain, is you really want to think about something we call local policy. So the operation of SMTP, the application of authentication results, you as the domain operator really have the last word in what happens. If SPF fails and it's a dash all, you are not bound to throw the mail away. If DKIM fails, you're not bound to throw the mail away or put it in a quarantine folder if you have that kind of capability. The, the final decision is ultimately yours based on an analysis of the mail stream coming into your domain and the performance of these authentication protocols. What DMARC does on top of that is gives you an expression of the sender's intent. So if you know your SPF and DKIM practices are solid and the sender is telling you throw away messages that fail the DMARC check, you can throw them away with a higher degree of confidence than you would if you were making an assumption about what their intent was behind SPF or DKIM without DMARC. So local policy comes into the case where you choose to make an informed decision based on what you've observed. This also applies to ignoring, if you will, the, D the DMARC evaluation. Um, say that you know you're receiving an SPF authenticated mail from a mailing list provider, but it doesn't pass the DMARC check. You can create a special list of known domains that if you see authenticating traffic and you have some other corroborating evidence, say you know statistically that authenticating mail from a given domain is legitimate regardless of the outcome of DMARC, you can choose to ignore a DMARC, say reject verdict in the case of one of those special domains. All of this stuff falls under what we call local policy. Um, the next thing is, as a receiver implementer of DMARC, you really have to think about the thing that's most important in the ecosystem where DMARC is concerned is reporting. Um, the sender being able to communicate to you how they want you to dispose of their mail is a powerful and meaningful step forward from what we have now. But being able to take the next step and pro provide aggregate reporting and forensic reporting back to the sender helps them improve their practices and in the case of legitimate fraud gives them insight into the actual nature of the fraud. So as an implementer, both from DMARC.org, the messaging community at, at large, we really want to impress upon you the, uh, the necessity and the importance of providing the reporting function in DMARC. Um, aggregate is a fairly straightforward thing, which we'll get into. Forensic, you'll want to sort of take note of the discussion about privacy later in this talk. Um, and then the final thing is, even though you're a receiver, you may send some outbound mail. Um, do you, do you pr publish a DMARC policy for your own domain? That really comes down to, again, like analyzing what your inbound traffic is, is who are you and what's your outbound traffic? If all you do is receive mail and you're, say, a regional ISP and you don't have much outgoing, or you kind of fall into the typical pattern of being an MVP or ISP, you may not want to publish a DMARC record. However, if you're somebody like Facebook, for example, where you have a very well-known brand, or you're eBay or LinkedIn, um, and you have a very well-known brand, uh, you have to assume other people are going to be trying to impersonate you. So you sort of have the reverse problem. You're providing fraud protection on inbound, but you also have to enable receivers of messages carrying your domain or your brand to take action on that stuff. So think about that as you're rolling it out. Um, of course, Publishing an outbound policy is much easier than doing the inbound validation and application of results and policy and generating reports. But just because it's publishing a DNS record doesn't mean you shouldn't really think through all of the potential issues with uh, now having receivers take action based on a, on a DMARC policy. Um, so just a quick review of what we presented in training. These are the highlights of policy enforcement. Um, DMARC is based upon uh, RFC compliant implementations of SPF and DKIM. So if you have buggy implementations of those or you're not fully sort of sure how they're operating, please do a thorough review of those because the operation of DMARC is only going to be as good or as solid as the operation of the underlying authentication mechanisms. So make sure that stuff is rock solid. Um, for bonus points, we ask that if you're not already doing it, insert an authentication results header into your message after you run SPF and DKIM validation. This provides a record of the message passing into your administrative domain and what your authentication results were for it. Um, 
Not so much an issue if you know you're the last hop in the delivery chain, but this, even for forensic purposes and looking at the message later and understanding what happened, why did policy get applied, inserting this header is just a good practice. Uh, you want to, as you're looking at your, your underlying auth results, those from SPF and DKIM, and you're evaluating DMARC, DMARC really just tells you how to select out of all of the available authentication results, the ones that are most meaningful to DMARC. This is the, pro the process called alignment, and this governs the, this deals with the relationship of the entity, the authenticated identity, their relationship to the 5322 from domain. Um, DMARC operates expressly on authentication results tied to identities that share the same domain as the from header in the message. So this is one of the sort of core principles behind DMARC is that the identity that the user sees the message coming from is the one that we're trying to authenticate. Uh, if you don't find any validated aligned results out of all of the SPF and DKIM results that you have at your disposal, it's time to enforce policy. This is where DMARC comes into play. So where you're going to look at the P equals none or the P equals quarantine and look at the percentage fields and operate that stuff. Now, you don't have to roll this implementation from scratch. There are open source implementations of this, such as OpenDMARC, uh, but this is the underlying process that's happening. So you're kind of looking at running your existing auth protocols, taking the results from those things, and then filtering them through a DMARC layer. So the two kinds of reporting. Um, aggregate is essentially a message that's sent by you as a receiver once every 24 hours. The sender can request that you send it more frequently, but what we're seeing actually in practice is that the most, both the most practicable or pragmatic interval and the most meaningful interval to do it over is, the, is one day. So every day you kick off a process where you send out a message that has an XML formatted attachment that details to the sender all of the IP addresses and the associated raw SPF and DKIM results and, D and DMARC aligned results that were computed for messages sent by those IP addresses. The receiver of that report, the domain owner, the brand owner, can then use that information to understand, hey, there's an IP address here that I don't recognize. Why are they sending mail for me? And they can take action on that. Same thing goes for, for the DKIM results. Um, if you're curious what other people have had, what other experiences they've had in generating, interpreting these reports, um, or even sort of the, the format and understanding what each of the different fields mean. Uh, we have a discussion list called DMARC Discuss. Uh, you can find all the information to join it at dmark.org uh, that you can kind of go and hang out with other people who've done this before, read through the archives, and sort of learn what other people have done. Um, aggregate reporting is the one thing we, we have the expectation that everyone does. You're sort of just reflecting operational data back to the sender in the first place. The forensic reporting is a whole other ball game. Forensic reports are formatted much the same as bounces or junk complaints. It's a three-part MIME document based on the auth failure reporting format spec, which is a sort of a derivative of ARF. So if you're familiar with sending bounces and you're familiar with sending junk complaints, forensic reports will look familiar to you. Um, what may not be readily apparent is that instead of sending original message content back to a reporting mailbox as a result of a recipient action, like Joe at Hotmail.com clicking report as junk or uh, bouncing a message back to someone as a result of a full mailbox or a bad address, here you're taking an action like that simply on the basis of authentication results and the policy that was applied. So messages that fail the DMARC check will be subject to this forensic reporting function. Um, in that regard, just be aware you're sending often though you have the choice of redacting it under AFREF, a full message as you received it. And so this carries some privacy concerns that you will need to evaluate sort of internally uh, whether you want to participate in this or not. So the ask from us is always do aggregate reports and really take a thorough look at your privacy policy, terms of use, all of that for your domain, and understand if you're also comfortable doing forensic reporting. Our goal is to get as many receiver domains mailbox providers and other participants on the DMARC validation side doing reporting as we possibly can. So the operational considerations, just so things you should know you're getting into. We've talked about um, the fact that a DMARC policy is a sender-specified policy. 
um, when you're evaluating it and you're looking at maybe you're picking up, maybe when you do DKIM you pick up an ADSP policy for the domain or you find some other policy format out there. If a sender publishes a DMARC policy, they have a reasonable expectation that that is the applicable policy. So in a, in a situation where as you're evaluating authentication results, you find multiple policies that could come into place, we would ask that you prefer the DMARC policy on top of it. And the specification for DMARC goes into some detail on this, so we do encourage you to refer back to that. Um, also, going back to the local policy discussion from earlier, consider the impact of things like mailing list managers and forwarders and other things that can get between sender and receiver in the SMTP pathway and affect the outcome of auth results. You are really the only person or the only entity that's going to know how those messages behave at your domain. So before you flip from p equals none to p equals reject or go from quarantine to reject or whatever, make sure you've really kind of analyzed for false positives and special cases in your messaging stream so that there aren't any surprises to your users when you start rejecting mail. Um, the thing to consider about failure reports as in terms of how they're generated and when they're sent versus aggregate reports, aggregate reports are sent on a predictable interval. You may generate one for every domain that you receive from per day. So if you receive from 200 domains and you generate all your reports at midnight, right around midnight, hopefully UTC, you're going to start generating 200 aggregate reports. They're going to go out and you're going to be done. Forensic reports, on the other hand, are sent whenever a message fails the DMARC check. So it's conceivable that somebody could use your domain to generate a lot of forensic reporting traffic into a specific domain. DMARC attempts to compensate for this by providing for a handshake of sorts between report generators and report receiving domains. That's section 8.2 of the spec. Please go read up on it and make sure that before you find yourself sending reporting content to a, a domain, that you can go through and verify that it in fact wants to receive that traffic. Um, finally, on reporting, uh, for forensic reports, there of all the ISPs that implement DMARC domestically in the United States, uh, very few of them have chosen to implement forensic reporting. The reason being that this can be user sensitive content, there's a chance for false positives and so on. The point is, don't be afraid of that. Go and quantify the risk to your organization and recognize that if you can see your way clear to providing this kind of traffic and this kind of information to the sending domain, you are doing them a valuable service. Just don't go into it blindly because we would much rather that you viewed implementing DMARC as a positive thing and that you were doing it kind of without any qualms and you knew what all the risks were with it before you kind of dive in head first. Again, forensic reports are special. You're reflecting an email transmitted to a user at your domain back to a reporting entity, which may or may not be the domain that sent it. There are third parties in the email ecosystem whose business is receiving, processing, and reporting out on DMARC reporting traffic. So know that you might be sending a reporting message to the domain that sent it or to somebody that's under contract by that domain to sort of do this analysis and reporting for them and just review that internally with your legal teams, your privacy policy people, and so on. Um, that's it. Uh, please go back up to dmark.org and check for uh, the resources we've got up there. We've got pointers to online reporting tools, uh, lots of information for implementing DMARC, um, open source implementations of it, links to all the discussion lists, and of course, the most current published revision of the spec.